Hello and welcome to the Hand Playing Challenge. I'm Mark, your host and sometimes referee. Today's challenge is going to be between two Chaplin's Patent planes made by Tower and Lion Company of New York. The first one is a Chaplin's original patent. The second is a Chaplin's improved patent. These are interesting to me. These are the weird planes that I referred to in the introduction. Uh, last week we covered the Stanley Bailey and the Stanley Bedrock. These two planes are about as far away from a Stanley Bailey and a Stanley Bedrock as I think it's possible to get in the hand plane world. So, without further ado, let's get right to it. Okay, let's meet our contestants. First up is a Chaplin's original patent. Uh, ma manufactured by Tower and Lion Company between about 1887 and 1900. It's, I don't think I can narrow it down any more than that 13 year period. It does not have very many markings on it except for the trademark on the cutter. It is however for sure a Chaplin's patent plane because uh, you can see the corrugations in the top part of the plane body and especially it's a dead giveaway to see this unique sort of depth adjustment lever here. Undoubtedly Chaplin's original patent. Now just because it has not very many markings doesn't mean that it doesn't have a model number. This is a model number 1005. Uh, they used either three or four digit model numbers for their planes if and it was basically depending on the material that the hand, knobs and totes were made out of as well as whether the bottom of the plane was corrugated or not. So if you had wooden knobs and uh, a wooden knob and wooden tote such as this one and it's corrugated on the bottom such as this one um, then it's a 1005 so basically for a smooth bottom you'd be it would be a two, 205 wooden handles corrugated bottoms 1005 or corrugated bottoms with vulcani vulcanized rubber totes and knobs would be at 12.05. So we're going to take this thing apart in a, in a minute, but the last thing to sort of note on this plane is unlike the improved patent plane, this has sort of the style elements in the sidewalls of the body, which are kind of a nice feature. Okay, let's take this thing apart. It's a fairly simple plane. Loosen the lever cap knob. Lever cap slides off. Cutter comes out. Be careful when you take off the lever cap. With these planes, there's nothing holding the cutter in. And it'll just slide right out. So cutter out. And then the last thing we see then is the frog. Basically the frog is controlled by this depth adjustment lever here. To the left is all the way up and all the way to the right is all the way down. And um, that's pretty much, I'm going to go ahead and take the frog off just to show you what it looks like underneath. There we go. That is the frog assembly. You can see that it has a fairly simple support for the frog. Not much there and 
you know, at first when I saw these planes, I thought, well, that must make it horribly wobbly. But in reality, it's actually pretty secure. It's, you know, basically clamped in three places so that you sort of have a triangular support system there, which, given the two-inch width down here, is fairly uh, secure. Okay, before we put it back together, let's take another look at the uh, depth adjustment lever. It's a fairly unique design. Most planes have sort of a screw arrangement, like in the Stanley Bailey or Bedrock case. In the Chaplin's original patent, they have this worm gear right here. A, a, a worm gear that mates with a worm wheel on the bottom of the frog just like that and so I'm going to hold it in there a little bit and so it goes up and down down and up and that's the way it works and as we'll see when we test out the plane for shavings that actually works pretty good I was a little bit uh, surprised when I first got this plane let's go ahead and um, put it back together so frog first there we go You want to tighten that down all the way. It still, it doesn't actually tighten that frog to the support because it still has to move up and down. The Chaplin's original patent has an integrated chip breaker. As you can see here, the chip breaker, the lever cap bears down in the middle of this attached piece of metal arched piece of metal that bears down on the cutter and functions as a chip breaker. You can also see in this close-up the sort of lugs here that grip onto the side of the frog that uh, tighten down and hold the cutter in place. Okay, one more thing I want to go through here is to discuss how to get the plane ready for shaving. Now in a, in, a, in a plane such as a Stanley Bailey where the chip breaker is independent from the lever cap, you usually adjust the chip breaker off the plane at the right depth, you know, at the right uh, distance from the end of the cutter. With an integrated chip breaker like this, you have to do things a little different. So what you're going to do here is sight down the, the, the top of the, of the plane, you're going to start with the depth adjustment at all the way up, the, all the way retracted. Then you're going to sight down here and set the chip breaker to your desired distance as close as you want it. You can make it just as close as in a Stanley Bailey. Then you lock and it might shift on you a little bit, but you can, before you get it tight, you can sort of put it back in. That's the lever cap adjusting that end piece. Okay, that's pretty good. So now we're going to tighten. So that you do the chip breaker first, then you adjust the depth of cut until it cuts. Now you can try to sort of wing that operation and start with this in some other position or whatnot but let me assure you you will not be happy with that process this is really the only way to do it otherwise you're going to end up being if you try to do it any other way you're going to end up being very very frustrated and as they say don't ask me how I know this
One last thing to mention here is that this Chaplin, the Chaplin's original patent planes have no lateral adjustment. Your lateral adjustment is done by hand, maybe with loosening the knob or with, you know, a hammer, something to tap back and forth to get the lateral adjustment correct. Okay, this is a Chaplin's improved patent plane. In contrast to the Chaplin's original patent plane, this guy is well marked. We have Chaplin's improved cast into the body. No doubt about the model number. This is number 1205. And if that wasn't enough for you, we also have the usual trademark on the top of the cutter. And we even, on the sidewall of the plane, there's a very faint, you can't see it in the video, but there's a faint stamp of Chaplin's improved patent here, as well as um, four different patent dates. Now, these planes were manufactured between 1900 and 1914. This particular plane was manufactured somewhere after 1902 because that's when the latest patent date is and uh, at 1914 was the last year because that's I think when they went out of business so um, other features of the plane that uh, we're going to unlike the original patent now we're just at smooth Stanley style sidewalls we've got a a lever cap with we're going to take it apart in a minute but this has a lateral adjuster built in on the front side of the cutter we'll see how that works and this is now instead of the unique lever on the previous plane this is the depth adjustment lever on this plane finally uh, whereas the previous plane the the original patent had wooden totes and knobs this plane has vulcanized rubber totes totes and knobs okay let's take this plane apart unscrew the lever cap no integrated chip breaker and it's not like it was just left off this chip breaker or this lever cap matches all the drawings and catalog entries so apparently they never made a chip breaker with this um, cutter comes out this is what the frog assembly looks like in, in the previous you know in the previous in the original patent the the lever cap gripped the sides of the frog this one has a keyhole type support this screw engages in that keyhole and slides down and provides the lever cap function one sort of issue with these planes that I find very strange is the frog has a very limited range of adjustment here all the way up all the way down about an eighth of an inch at most and despite the fact that the frog here has a fairly large slot it's got a fairly limited range of motion and that motion can only be in one place we're going to go ahead and take this off so that you can see why I'm saying that the depth adjustment lever there's a a a pin right here that this lever rotates on there's this this is the this is the hole that the retaining screw went in so it's pretty much fixed in that position and so that has such a that hole which is what you know secured by the the screw basically dictates where the position of the frog has to be and since it has 
relatively limited swing there, you know, there just isn't much up and down movement in the frog. Now, this frog is sits on here. There's a sort of a V groove here that rests in this uh, top part of the frog support, somewhat like that. Just like on the original patent plane, you know, it kind of the arrangement kind of looks shaky to begin with. However, because it just like in the original patent, it has a two-inch wide machine surface here, so you have the same sort of triangular clamping area, and it holds it relatively securely. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and uh, put it back together. Tightening it down, same kind of arrangement. It'll tighten down, but it doesn't actually tighten the frog to the support. Okay, so there you have it. Frog is there. Surface cutter. This. You might have to go into the slot to get this into the keyhole, but it goes in uh, eventually. Okay, now it's all the way down in the keyhole, and then you tighten. And the, the depth adjuster basically engages with the slot in the cutter and moves the cutter back and forth. Now, one of the reasons I was, uh, you know, perplexed when I saw this plane, it actually does not have a chip breaker. When you put it all together with the lever cap all the way down and everything seated the way it should be, you can see that there is a, a large distance between the end of the lever cap and the and the end of the cutter. There's no way, that's, that's nearly a quarter of an inch. There's no way that that lever cap is serving as a uh, chip breaker. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, it's not this, you know, planes don't have to have a chip breaker. But I'm certainly used to using one on all my western style planes. So I found that very odd. Now, before we go to further with the comparison, I'd like to mention a couple of suspicious things with this plane. One is this cutter is only 1 and 13 16 inches wide. It should be 2 inches. So someone has either put a custom blade in there. You can see that it doesn't go all the way across. It just doesn't go all the way across. And that's, that's a problem. Um, the other suspicious thing for this plane is that this lever cap is brand new looking and it makes me suspect that it was either a replacement or someone maybe has re redone the nickel plating I don't know it's just very it's it doesn't match the rest of the plane so both of these features make me think that this might well be a, uh, a Franken plane however that doesn't change the comments I made about the chip breaker because in other references I've heard people say that they're uh, the the distance between the lever cap and the end of the cutter is you know larger than what it would normally be up to in one other reference he quoted three sixteenths of an inch and it's a little bigger on this one but nonetheless it doesn't appear that the lever cap is intended to function as a chip breaker 
Okay, here's another look at a comparison between the two planes. So the chip, the cutters, as you can see, this one is narrower than it should be compared to the original patent plane. You can see that the original patent plane flares out here. This one starts to, but then stops. Makes me think that somebody may have ground off the sides for whatever reason. Who knows? It's definitely an original patent cutter, or improved patent cut cutter. It's, it's stamped on the, on, the, on the top of the cutter, but it is not the appropriate width. You can see the difference in the frogs. This one is definitely a little wider, which probably gives it a little more uh, support. You can see the difference in the lever caps. It kind of makes me wonder on this plane why they didn't just go ahead and install the chip breaker on it. I'm wondering if that was a cost cutting mechanism. It could easily have been mounted in there in the same way. So that is a little strange. And um, lastly, a point, a thing that I wanted to point out on these is, and this is true in both planes, both planes have about the same size tote and knob, but they're very small. I can only get three fingers there. I'm, nor I'm used to being able to put my whole hand in on the tote, but the, these totes on both of these planes are fairly small and not, ver not actually very comfortable. And then lastly, on the, on the original patent plane, it has the wooden knob here in the front. They've got kind of an odd sort of rivet arrangement here, and the knob is actually not fixed in place. I find that disconcerting. I'm just so used to having the knobs be tightened down that I'm, I've, it just feels very odd to me when I use this plane. Okay, let's take a shaving. First up, Chaplin's original patent. Freshly jointed piece of soft maple as described in the previous videos. Pretty good. Can't argue with that. It's a little rank. Maybe I can uh, back off the cutter a little bit. It's a little bit off to one side. I don't know if I want to mess around with it too much. Let's just try to Do that. Yeah. Alrighty then. That is a perfectly fine shaving, full length of the board. Like I say, I could back off a little bit on the cutter if I wanted a thinner shaving, but certainly you can see that the plane is functioning as expected. Let's just go ahead and do that just for for a quickie, we'll raise her up just a tiny bit. Yeah, that responded. Didn't quite get the whole length of the board, but it's a nice thin shaving. It's working pr pretty good. So, there's your Chaplin's original patent. Now up is the Chaplin's improved patent with, like I say, not much in the way of a chip breaker. So let's see. Okay, now we're ready for the Chaplin's improved patent. It's taken a, quite a bit of fiddling to get this one to work. It still isn't performing real well, as you can see.
getting much narrow a much narrower shaving I'm pretty certain I didn't camber the blade any more than I usually do so there's a bad sign I mean, it would work if you had nothing else, but there we go. So, a little more irregular shavings, narrower. I think I'm not going to mess around with it too much because because of the problem with the blade not being as wide as it should be and the issue with the chip breaker this maple here has very regular grain so you know a blade without a chip breaker would be expected to do pretty well on it but with no chip breaker I'd hate to see this thing on highly figured grain probably wouldn't do very well at all Okay, that's the conclusion of our test on the Chaplin's original patent and the Chaplin's improved patent. The Chaplin's original patent has some strikes against it. Don't like the rotating knob. I'm a fixed knob man myself. Um, don't like the comfort of the tote. It's awfully small. And, you know, it's annoying when your plane drops out of your your cutter drops out of your plane when you loosen the lever cap. However, all in all though, it worked pretty well. I would, you, know, you worry about some things, you know, it's got the little skinny support for the frog, but it holds pretty good. Uh, it took a fine shaving. So, it's okay. The Chaplin's Improved Patent, it has definite strikes against it, no chip breaker. Um, I've noticed, I didn't comment when I was doing the cut, the shaving the test, but it, it in this particular case, the act, operation of the lateral lever tends to loosen the lever cap knob a little bit. I, that can't be, you know, can't be good. That can't be the way it's supposed to be. Maybe the, and, and, you know, a definite strike is the minimal range on the depth adjustment. Um, so, the con my conclusion here today is that the Chaplin's improved patent was not really an improvement over the Chaplin's original patent. However, I certainly have to put an asterisk on that because of the issues we noted before. If this is really a Frankenplane, it's not probably a good test of a Chaplin's improved patent plane. So I would be very interested if viewers out there could share their experiences on the Chaplin's Improved Patent Plane. So if it's actually better than what I've observed, we certainly want to get the, you know, correct the record and make sure that there's no misinformation about these, these planes. And this, in sort of an editorial comment, this is exactly the sort of reason I made these videos. Uh, these kinds of observations just aren't available in the references. No one talks about usability in their references and that's what we're after today is usable. Where Are they usable or not? You know, if I, fortunately I buy, you know, non-collector type planes and so I'm not out 
a huge investment. But if I had splurged 200 bucks on a, you know, perfect example of this, and then it didn't actually work, I'd be an unhappy camper. So, so that's why. So that, that that's basically one of the reasons for doing this video series. At any rate, so just one more time in conclusion. I like the Chaplin's original patent better than the Chaplin's improved patent. Thanks and uh, stay tuned for the next episode.